Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cornwall Library's Winter Program Part 2. It's great to be with you again. My name is Sandy Feigelhorn, friend of the library and a birding enthusiast. Can you believe it? Spring is just one week away. Given how many we are today, I, we have three important announcements before we begin. We have muted your microphones. As you have questions, be sure to enter them in the chat area of your screen so we can cover them in the final 10 minutes. Second announcement is the library is counting on you to give us your thoughts on future topics for programs. So far, we've offered literature, current events, now nature, all stemming from ideas provided by you. The Library Program Committee needs your input to plan for the fall. And finally, third, the library has been happy to provide these two bird programs free of charge. Yet they cost us to produce, including videotaping and putting them up on YouTube for your and others' future reference. Believe me, any contribution you make is very, very welcome. Just use our website to make a donation or send a check to the Cornwall Library. Uh, now it's time for the program. This one, Bethany, will, will tell us how to prepare the spring with plantings that sustain birds in our backyards, be it as food attracting insects or as material for nest building. Here's Bethany Shepherd, Natros, and Sharon Audubon. Thank you, Bethany. Hope you enjoy our program. Hi, thank you so much, Sandy, for, again, for the warm introduction. And um, again, a huge, a huge thank you to the Cornwall Library staff who have been entirely supportive in the second installation of our program in feeding birds and observing birds and ultimately in helping to preserve them. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Okie dokie. Right. Oh, sorry, folks. Of course, as I go to share my screen for my PowerPoint, it doesn't show up. So let's go ahead. I'm going to try that again here. <clears throat> Aha, here we go. All righty. <clears throat> ah, yes. Okie dokie. <clears throat> All righty. So for those of you who are joining us who attended the first part of this two part presentation. Thank you again for returning and welcome to those of us who are joining us for the first time in the second installation. In the first part of our program series, we learned about what it means for birds to be a migrant versus a resident. And so we're going to do just a teeny little bit of review here in this presentation here just to get you warmed up. Uh, second, we're going to dive right in there afterwards to identifying our birds and looking at some of the field markings that we can start to pay attention to um, in being able to tease apart one bird species from another. That's going to be especially important as we're getting our early spring arrivals that are coming back to us from their breeding grounds, whether it be in the southeastern part of the United States or in countries even farther away in Central and South America. And as Sandy mentioned, in the latter part of the presentation, we're going to go and talk about um, some of the plantings that we can start to incorporate into our landscapes that help sustain birds throughout the breeding season, right? So in the first program, we talked about bird seed and how that helps sustain birds. Uh, now we're going to be switching gears and talking about a more sustainable food source that's going to help sustain them again through the breeding season and even beyond into the winter months. Last but not least, we're going to talk just a little bit about our wildlife rehabilitation clinic that we have here at the Sharon Audubon Center and how that ties in to bird conservation. And I promise you that I will do a better job this time around at leaving some space for Q&A at the end of the presentation for folks to ask some questions. All righty, so if it is all right with everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. So let's do, again, just a little bit of a review here and talking about our migrant versus our resident. And um, Sandy, I just want to do a quick check here. I just switched my view here. So I want to make sure people are seeing the full slide and not any of the notes that I have. So if you I could let me know. Slide. I see uh, the chickadees versus the tree swallows. Okay, perfect. All right. Just wanted to do a check. Great. Thanks. 
Awesome. So again, in talking about what it means for our birds to be migrants versus resident, if we take a look at our black capped chickadee here on the right hand side of the screen, this bird is what we would term a resident here in the state of Connecticut, meaning that it is generally remaining here in the area for the entirety of the year, right? We see this bird at our feeders likely if we had our feeders up in the wintertime, but we see it the rest of the seasons too, as again, it is a resident species with us here in Connecticut. This is very different when we contrast this bird against our tree swallows here on the left-hand side of the screen. Where these are birds that we see only during the spring and the summer months uh, before they depart southbound to eventually overwinter in parts of Central America um, as obligate insectivores and needing that insect protein, which they can find readily down there. So we can see this dichotomy here contrasted in this map that we have. Um, so if we look at the range map of black cab chickadees, Again, we see just the single color displayed, right? We see just the purple indicating that it's not just a year round species here in the state of Connecticut, but it's a resident species throughout the entirety of its range. And this is very different than again, um, when we're contrasting it against our tree swallow, um, which is breeding in the upper half of the United States and then in parts of Canada and Alaska, moving through the central part of the country during its migratory journey, and then ultimately ending up again in the tropical regions of Central America and in some of the islands off of the coast of Florida. So let's get right into some of the good stuff in today's presentation and let's start talking about some of these field marks that we can become familiar with as we begin to tease apart these bird species from one another. And again, I mentioned this is a very exciting time to start doing this because our birds are starting to come back to us, friends. They are starting to go back from parts of the southeastern US and Central and South America. And so if you have been outside and have been tuning in to some of these early arrivals, you're likely to recognize some of them that I have in the upcoming slides. <clears throat> So when people are first starting to get out and starting to bird for the first time, I often recommend that they start learning about birds from the family level and not just as individual species because as many of us have likely experienced, it can be very daunting to start learning our bird species if we look at a bird out in the world and then we're trying to flip through a field guide and figure out which that species is, right? It's, there are a lot of birds in the United States and there are just under 440 species recorded here in the state of Connecticut alone and just under 500 in the state of New York, right? So that's a lot to be trying to pick apart from one another. So again, starting from the family level can be a lot more productive and ultimately more helpful when we're starting to learn our birds, right? So if we start learning our owls or start becoming more familiar with our wading birds, right? Like our herons and um, ibis and some other members of that family, or maybe some of our birds of prey, our hawks and our eagles, for example. And then once we get a little bit more skilled, and we're coming into the spring season, we might tackle our warbler species up here, right? So again, becoming familiar with those families first can be really helpful. And several people after our first presentation where I so showed this slide, inquired where they could purchase this poster because indeed it is an actual poster that folks can buy online uh, to frame and put in their homes as a lovely conversation piece and beautiful piece of art, but also as a really helpful educational tool too. So if you wish to receive a follow-up email with some resources after today's presentation, we will be sure to include where you can check out this poster. All right, so again, for those of you who are with us for the first presentation, I wanted to mix it up in some ways during this first part of a review so that you weren't too terribly bored and can still flex some of your bird ID skills here. <laughs> so in going over some of these, what we call field marks, these are some of the characteristics that we can start to familiarize ourselves with. Again, as we're starting to learn which species are which in our backyards, in our public spaces, parks, things like that. So let's go ahead and take a look at these one by one here as it applies to this bird that I have on the left. Notice I did not include the name yet because I'm going to have you guys tell me which species you think it is after we go through all of these field marks there in the chat in just a second. So let's go through the first one here. We have plumage, which is really just the fancy scientific way of saying a bird's feathers. So we can certainly look at the bird's feathers as a characteristic in trying to identify what it is, right? We know that birds come in all different kinds of colors of the rainbow. And so plumage could oftentimes be a good indicator of what a bird is. But it's not just the color of the feathers that we can hone into. It's also sometimes special feather groupings. So some birds like our Northern Cardinals or our Tufted Titmice have a cluster of feathers atop their head called a crest which can indicate mood and um, states of aggression sometimes or just general feelings that the bird is experiencing. So that's 
something else that we can tune into when we're talking about the plumage of a bird is those special feather groups. The second is the size, right? And of course, we're not talking about dimensions. We're not saying that our birds are one by two or four by eight, none of that. When we're describing the bird's size to somebody else, it is perfectly okay to compare that to another bird that we're familiar with, right? So we could say, you know, the bird that I saw in my backyard was robin sized or it was crow sized or jay sized. Again, something that we're all familiar with or that most people are gonna be familiar with. But if that doesn't work for you, there is no shame in comparing that bird to the size of an inanimate object that might work for you, right? So that could be a baseball, a basketball. If it's a little wren that you're trying to describe to somebody, that could be a golf ball, for example, right? So if we're looking at the bird on the side here, that could be a J size, right? That might be about the approximation of the bird that I'm looking at. And we didn't talk about plumage, so we could say also for describing the feathers of this bird that it has this really nice kind of warm, rusty brown coloration throughout the body with these nice little flecks of brown that start beneath the throat and then extend over the breast and the belly, right? Those could be things that we pay attention to in regards to plumage. So for the structure of the bird, we're really asking ourselves, what kind of a shape does our bird have that we're looking at? Is it small and compact with rounded wings? Does it have more elongated wings? Does it have a long tail like my bird in the left-hand photo does? Things like that. What kind of a shape does a bird have? Because just like all different kinds of sizes, our birds come in all different kinds of shapes too. Behavior is going to be a major field mark that we really start paying attention to come the spring and the breeding season, right? Because our birds are gonna be doing all kinds of things sticking out their territories and trying to eject interlopers coming into those territories, right? So there are gonna be some specific behaviors that related to territory defense. But then of course, with territory defense comes the males trying to woo the females of that species, right? So they're gonna be engaging in very specific courtship behaviors too that we might begin to learn because oftentimes those can be species specific. The habitat of course is important to begin becoming familiar with when we're trying to learn where our birds are in the world, right? Where are our birds living? We do know that birds have evolved to adapt to all sorts of different environments out in the world, whether that be deserts or fields, coastlines or forests. The bird on the left-hand side of the photo here loves to hang out in habitats where there's ample cover, you know, via thickets, for example, or low-lying shrubs. It really kind of likes to skulk around in those types of environments. So we do have it here in Northwestern Connecticut, but again, so long as there's ample cover and thick, thick, you know, brush around, you're likely to find this species. The song, just like I said with behavior and tuning into that during the spring season, the song is also gonna be an important field mark for us to really become familiar with and start learning when we're IDing our birds in the spring and summer, because as males are singing, again, both to you know, kind of showcase, hey, this is my territory, keep out. But also, hey, ladies, I'm single. Why don't you come over here sort of thing, right? They're going to be singing a lot for those reasons. So when we become familiar with these birds' song, we can then gain more confidence in being able to identify which bird is which. Because just like behaviors, song can be very ultra-specific to the species. So let's go ahead and take a listen here to the song of my bird on the left. <laughs> That's just a very short snippet of a very long song that this particular species was singing in the clip that I downloaded. This bird, before you tell me what it is, holds the world record for the number of songs it is able to incorporate in its repertoire, including no fewer than 2,000 songs. Yes, you heard that correctly, not 200. 2,000 songs this bird is able to incorporate into its repertoire. Now, I want you guys to go ahead and tell me in the chat what you think or know this bird to be. Go for it. All right, we've got one guess so far. Anybody else? Yeah, okay, we've got a couple of different guesses, good. So this bird, Somebody got it. This bird, though it does look like a thrush with the color of its feathers, it is actually a brown thrasher. Mm. Yeah. And so that should be, oh, it looks like my slide froze here. So that should be coming up for you guys to see. Oh, there we go. <laughs> 
Yeah. Always some little glitch with Zoom. All right, yes, yeah, so Brown Thrasher. Good guesses, everybody, though, based on the plumage and other aspects that you were looking at. All righty, so now I'm gonna have you guys put that into practice here, and I'm gonna give you the chance to participate a little bit more as we go through here with these two little adorable little nestlings. We're gonna go through those six field marks, and I'm gonna have you guys give me some observations in the chat about each one of these quickly as we go through. So looking at my two birds here, again, without revealing the species, I want you to tell me a little bit about what you notice with the plumage. What kinds of colors do you see? Or which kinds of feather groupings maybe stick out to you in this particular bird that I have? And again, if you know it, I want you to refrain from saying it in the chat until we get to the end. <clears throat> All right, so some of you might be able to notice, oh, there goes the chat, okay, very good. Yeah, great. So some of you are talking about the fluffiness of the feathers, right? That might tell you something about the stage of development of this particular bird. Very good. Ah, we're noticing some feather groupings at the top of the head here, which is actually really important for this certain species within um, its family group. Right, very good observations. Okay, so let's go through to the next one. All right, size. If you were describing this bird to somebody else, how would you describe its size? What would you liken it to? Okay, open hand. And it's kind of tough with this bird because um, you don't really have anything to scale it up against. It's not like standing next to anything that's really obvious <laughs> about its size, right? So large size potentially, yeah. Honestly, if I was looking at this particular bird, I would liken it to a garden gnome. <laughs> Just your average garden gnome that you have in your yard because that's about the size of these little nestlings when they're this old, right? Let's look at some other field marks here. Yeah, structure, what's the shape of this bird? It has sort of like a uniform shape to it, right? But some of those feather groupings that you guys told me about earlier in your observations, those little tufts atop the head, give us a little bit of a break in that otherwise uniform structure, right? Which is important. Behavior. So the behavior is actually very interesting for this particular species during this particular stage of development too, because what happens is at this stage in development, these birds are gonna to start to inch away from their nest on the branch that their nest is perched on, right? They're gonna to start to inch away, exploring, testing the strength of their feet, flapping their wings, right? But they don't always stay balanced on that stick, unfortunately. Sometimes they fall to the forest floor, but it's not a death sentence for these birds. They have such strong feet and such sharp talons at this stage that what they do is they climb straight up the trunk of the tree oftentimes and make it right back into that nest. So they are thus called branchers in this stage of development because of that behavior. So if you might see that, that could be indicative of what this species might be if you already hadn't noticed some of those other features that you guys told me about. All right, habitat. Where does this species of bird live? What can you guys tell me about the habitat that they like to reside in? Oh yes, Vicki, one of our volunteers here at Sharon Audubon mentioned head moving side to side for behavior, yes. And so they are gauging their depth perception, right? They are learning how to gauge how far away objects are when they're doing that. Trees, woods, people are talking about components of their habitat. Yeah, that's one component. They do like to reside in forests, but this species of bird is actually one of our most adaptable in all of North America because they can reside in forests, in deserts, in swamps, in river bottom lands. They can exist in virtually every habitat except open grasslands. So again, very, very adaptable species. And last but not least, looking at our last field mark here, I'm gonna talk about the song or the call. Uh, great Orange Howl, Howl Owl calls are very distinctive in the, in the way that they kind of issue these deep hoots, but let's give a listen to the call of the nestlings because I think this might surprise many of you. <laughs> Did you guys hear that shriek? Has anybody ever heard this shriek in the middle of the night and it scared the daylights out of you and you have no idea what it is? It could very well be the nestling of our, what do you guys think this bird is? Go ahead and tell me in the chat right now. It is our great horned owl. Yeah, so looking somewhat like the adults in this video clip, right? But still some of that natal down present on the bodies. Good job, guys. So if we wanted to take our ID just a little bit further, um, we can look at some specific feather groupings to try to tease our birds apart, right? And this is gonna be, I keep 
you know, emphasizing, hey, this is going to be important in the spring breeding season, but guess what? It is. <laughs> so if we look at the feather groupings that I have circled on the slide, the crown, the breast, the belly, right? Those alone are going to be really important and are going to be really conspicuous areas of the body when we're looking at specific field markings on the birds, right? So if we take a look at our Canada warbler, for example, we see this beautiful marking that we call a necklace. And this is one of my very favorite warblers because of this field marking, this very clear sort of chandelier like necklace that's sprayed across the breast there, very nice. So again, if I didn't see a whole lot of this bird and I just saw a fleeting glimpse of it, but I saw that necklace, that would tell me this is a Canada warbler I'm looking at, right? But believe it or not, the undertail coverts, this little patch of feathers underneath the tail can also be really distinctive in birds too, because sometimes that can display really bold and conspicuous colors. And of course the tail can have certain colors or markings, uh, bands present too, that can tease bird species apart from one another in a given family. Um, so those are all ones that are generally great feather groupings to start becoming familiar with when identifying our birds. But as we can see in my next slide here with these two warbler species and where my arrows are placed, we might start also paying attention to a few more of these groups of feathers on our birds. Um, again, as our spring males are going to start to look really studly here before too long as they're coming back into their territories. Right, so if we just look at a couple of these feather groupings here as they're listed on my slide, our crown, our breast, and the belly, and we contrast them in these two species here, we can see just a lot of differences off the bat, right? If we look at the crown, for example, we can see the black on the top of the head of my bird on the right, which is part of this beautiful black mask that the species bears, very different than the tiny little yet conspicuous yellow marking on the crown of my bird on the left hand side. And if we look in the breast and the belly too, we have very different markings where it's quite a bit busier on my bird on the left, right? With some black there, a nice little black patch with some streaking on the breast and the belly but with a nice sort of gentle yellow wash that extends down the breast and the belly of my bird on the right hand side that kind of turns into a sort of pale white down there, right? Very different, but where my arrows are marked too indicate, first of all, what's called the flank here on my bird on the left, right? This nice conspicuous patch of yellow, which is not just present on this particular species, but can often be um, a nice colorful patch on a lot of other warbler species in particular when we're talking about our spring males. And this arrow indicates a feather grouping from whence the common name of this bird species is derived. This species is comically also referred to as a butter butt. So if you know which species I'm talking about here with my bird on the left-hand side, go ahead and tell me in the chat right now. <clears throat> All right, we'll see if we have any guesses here. Very good, Terrence. Yes, this bird is indeed a yellow rumped warbler. Very good, very good, Vicky too. Yeah, thanks guys. Yes, yellow rumped. Again, we can't really see it super well in this picture, but a little teaser of that butter butt is there for us. Now, our bird on the right-hand side is also a member of the warbler family, but it is a common yellow throat. Our yellow rumped warbler, when it comes back to Northwestern Connecticut, can be found in um, softwood stands, right? So areas where we have dense conifers. And actually at Mudge Pond, these species were have, um, they were documented in eBirds who have been breeding back in 2019. So we might see them again this year. Our common yellow throat in contrast prefers wet areas. And because they tend to like to hide and, and reeds and cattail stands and places like that, we oftentimes hear their witchity, witchity, witchity song before we actually see the bird itself. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and get into it now. Really get into the good stuff with our early spring arrivals. So with this species that I won't reveal yet, this species is a member of the flycatcher family. And so uh, we see this species oftentimes coming in in early spring and taking up residence very close to where we like to live, right? So many of you have probably had close contact with this bird as the adorable little nestlings or fledglings rather on the right hand side of the slide. We see them in the nest, usually built on barns or on the eaves of our houses or on our garages. These birds tend to build their mud and grass made nests on human structures, right? But when we see them apart from the nest, um, as a member of the flycatcher family, they are often perched like our bird on the left-hand side of the slide is. And they do what we call sallying out from that perch to be able to catch insects on the wing before returning to that perch and then doing that again, right? These birds are um, 
in the flycatcher family, they're wintering a little bit further north than other members of that family. So they're hanging out in parts of southern US and northern Mexico. So when they come back to the breeding grounds, they have a little bit of a leg up on other members of the flycatcher group because they winter just a little bit further north. So they get here pretty early comparatively. Uh, the last thing I will mention about this species is that it does say part of its common name in its song. So let's go ahead and have a listen to what that sounds like. So many of you probably know this bird, but go ahead and put it in the chat if you do. It is none other than our Eastern Phoebe. I heard my first male calling just on River Road under the Cornwall Bridge just yesterday. So keep an ear out for these birds because they are starting to come back to us. Very exciting. So our second early arrival in the Songbird group is our Red Winged Blackbird, which is personally my favorite early spring arrival. I just love the distinctive call that the male issues as he comes back onto territory up here. And it just, to me, it always makes me feel that spring has truly arrived when I start to see and especially hear them. Um, so I've started to hear these guys too this past week. And just again, when I was walking under Cornwall Bridge just yesterday and doing some birding, these guys are coming back in droves. So if you have started seeing them and hearing them, go ahead and tell us in the chat right now because you stood really start to be observing these guys here in the coming weeks as they start to flood back into the area. When we talk about the plumage of this species here, um, this, this particular bird expresses a phenomenon we refer to as sexual dimorphism in ornithology, which is just a fancy way of saying that these birds have um, different color feathers. Um, that term can apply to different sizes between male and female, different shapes, and mostly we're talking about different colors between the sexes, right? So we can see that very clearly in this species here. Um, the female red-winged blackbird is oftentimes just entirely written off as a different bird altogether. And I am not ashamed to say that I made my mistake over and over again when I was first birding. I would just think that was a completely different species because of how different it looks, right? But there is an evolutionary advantage to that plumage coloration in our female red wing, right? She's really well camouflaged into the reeds that she nests in. So that's really advantageous for her to be hidden while she's sitting on that nest with eggs or with young in that, um, in, in that nesting area. Another thing I'll mention about these birds too, when we're talking about behavior, um, we notice the male very studly looking on the left-hand side of the slide with those very bright and bold epaulets or shoulder patches. Um, while that is um, a sex signal to the female red-winged blackbird, that's not the only thing that she's interested in when looking at displaying males. Actually, she's just as interested in, if not more so, in the territory that the male red wing procures. So in studies performed on the species, nine times out of 10, a female red wing blackbird would mate and take up territory or residence with a male red wing blackbird, even if he had other mates on his territory. But so long as his territory was situated over water, she would choose an already mated male, like I said, nine times out of 10, as opposed to mating with an unmated male who had territory on land. We know that these birds just really tend to value that buffer that the water provides when they're building their nests inside the reeds, you know, over that river, or excuse me, not river, but over that lake or that small pond, just really seems to be valuable for them. So enjoy these guys as they start to come in again, like I said, because you should really start to see and hear them soon. So we've talked about a couple of songbirds that are coming back, we cannot, overlook our ground dwelling American woodcock when we talk about Amer early spring arrivals. This guy, very, very curious looking bird, looks sort of part alien, part bird, um, and can be tempting to think of as being bigger than they actually are. Um, oftentimes when I see photos of this bird, it's really tempting for me to think that they're sort of kiwi size, you know, like these birds in New Zealand, but they're actually not much larger than the size of our American robin. Right? But don't let their small little dinky size fool you because they are an earthworm's worst nightmare. If you look at the dirt on the bill of this bird, you can see that it's a tool that is used for really probing into soft soil and finding those earthworms and other annelids that are hiding in that soil. Right? These guys have a couple of evolutionary advantages up their sleeve, right? So when we look at these birds, we may think it looks really bizarre for their eyes to be placed where they are, almost on top of the bird's head. But that allows them, in a similar way it allows a rabbit, to have a 360 degree view of the world at all times, which is a pretty amazing superpower. 
right? So these birds are tiny, like I said, not much bigger than a robin, and they're spending almost all of their time on the ground. Um, so they need to be able to see around them because they are really a tasty snack for so many other animals out in the world. So that vision is really helpful for them. Um, you also notice too, right? When thinking back to our field marks, we talk about plumage, just check out the camouflage that this bird is awarded. Um, we have a type of camouflage displayed on this bird called cryptic camouflage. So when you think of it on the ground, especially imagining a female sitting atop her nest, if a predator comes by, she will more often than not actually just kind of melt and lean herself into the forest floor. So you can imagine those colors just becoming one with the colors present in that forest understory, right? It really allows her to be able to hide well. These birds in the springtime are known for their spectacular displays, which involves something, a piece of, which I'm gonna show you here in a second. And in addition, a dazzling aerial display too that involves the male actually being able to generate sound using the air rushing through some of his primary feathers. But let's take a look at at least the ground portion of the male's displaying behavior that was featured at Greenwich Audubon Society recently captured by one of our colleagues there. I like how he departs before he goes into the aerial display. He almost looks like he gets kind of like beamed up by a starship. <laughs> but again, when we're focusing back again to some of those initial um, field marks that we were talking about, courtship display, right? So very specific courtship display here. We can observe with our American woodcock. We see it rotating in this almost 360 degree circle. And even though the volume was kind of low, could you all hear the little peeps? the nasally paint calls that it was giving as it was rotating, that's a pretty core part of that display too, in addition to, again, the aerial portion that I mentioned. If you guys are wanting to see this bird now, right now is the time because the males are back and our land manager, Mike Dudek, just heard one the other day on Sharon Audubon property issuing that painting sound. So if you live or you have a clearing on your property that's a field or a meadow, um, do go and look around that, especially if it has like a nice protective forest edge there that the bird can go in and roost in after. That's great habitat for these birds to display on. So keep a lookout for them. Okay, so moving on to one of our early arriving species of waterfowl. Our very, very colorful wood duck is also starting to return to us. These are inarguably our most ornate species of duck here in the Eastern United States, who possesses this really lovely and distinctive crest in addition to the males possessing this entire rainbow essentially displayed throughout their body, right? You look at the head of these birds and there's the entire rainbow pretty much present right there. Uh, as these guys are coming into their territories now and beginning to nest, uh, these ducks are cavity nesters. And so they're gonna be looking for nesting cavities either via man-made boxes like a wood duck box that um, are often found in this area, put up in, in small lakes or ponds, or they're gonna be looking for natural cavities too in dead or, or, or live trees, right? But so long as these cavities are situated next to water bodies so that the young have easy access to them. It's kind of an amazing thing. These young, they hatch in less, sometimes fewer than two days later, these young sort of parachute out of that nest cavity, bounce off the forest floor. Trust me, there are lots of comical videos you can find of this phenomenon on YouTube afterwards if you are so interested in looking at it. Um, and then they follow mama right to that water body. And like I said, are in the water, learning all of what it means to be a wood duck and sometimes fewer than two days after they hatch. Um, but this bird, in addition to, you know, being commonly found around water and, and really getting its young out into the world very early on, um, this duck is very high strung and is easily startled. So if you do come upon it, again, maybe if you're hiking around a pond or a lake, um, just do take care if you do see them, because if you don't see them and you happen to just come up on them suddenly, uh, they will flush and the female will issue this call here. Let's give a listen.
So if that's happened to you, which it has certainly happened to me, I haven't seen wood ducks present and suddenly I come up on them and then I flush them and the female gives that alarm call. Um, if you've heard that and haven't seen the duck, then that is your wood duck there. <clears throat> and so to round out our early arrivals, we are gonna hit on a raptor species that's starting to come back into the area too before too long, which is our dazzling American kestrel, our smallest falcon in the entire United States. So similar to the red-winged blackbird, these birds also display sexual dimorphism where the male has this really stunning slate, slate gray coloring throughout the wings and atop the head where the female just lacks that color altogether on the body, right? She's more of the cinnamon brown that you see on the back of the male with that black barring throughout her body. Still is lovely just without the slate gray coloration. I didn't put her in the slide because I thought, well, these chicks are just pretty cute and I think folks are going to appreciate seeing those. So I featured some of the chicks that were taken out of a nest box that we help monitor um, as a contribution to Art Gingert's Kestrel Nest Box Conservation Project. So thank you Art if you were on today's program for this project that he started over 40 years ago now installing nest boxes here in Northwestern Connecticut to help bolster the population of the species that has been in decline over the majority of its range across the United States. Now, these birds need open fields and meadows, um, grasslands in order to hunt in as they hunt predominantly small rodents, but also large insects like grasshoppers and various large caterpillars. Uh, they need those to be able to feed the young that you see in the photo. So without those spaces, they just don't have areas to hunt in, right? So um, we've been contributing again through Sharon Audubon and through the work of Mike Dudek, um, who I tagged along with on a few of these Kestrel visits last year and helping to monitor about 18 boxes here in Northwestern Connecticut. Um, Art does most of the heavy lifting with monitoring 60 something in the area. So again, we're, we're happy to participate in this project and are very proud to keep doing so. So these two species really quickly are what I call my drive-bys, <laughs> our species that are just with us for only a few days before continuing northward on their journeys. Both the fox sparrow and the rusty blackbird are breeders that go all the way up to parts of northern Canada and even into Alaska. So again, when we see them, they're just stopping by for quick little fuel ups before continuing on that journey north. And I love, love, love seeing the fox sparrow here because it's a really large sparrow first and foremost. So when you see it on the ground underneath your bird feeder, you're gonna see suddenly like, hey, I'm looking at something different here because it's gonna appear like Godzilla compared to the other sparrows that are at your feeder likely. It is just a big rotund sparrow. But secondly, I also really enjoy just this beautiful warm reddish brown coloration that the sparrow bears too. With that distinctive marking there that you see on the breast, and this kind of triangles of that warm reddish brown color that you see just kind of cascading down from that central spot there. This sparrow too, when we talk about behavior again as being a distinctive field marking in our birds, I love what the sparrow does with its feet. So the sparrow has super strong legs and feet and it'll use them to scratch at the soil simultaneously to dig around in leaf litter looking for insects that are hidden in there and also little seeds that might be there for it to eat. So if you see this really kind of big rotund reddish sparrow that's really scratching at the earth getting that stuff that is most likely going to be your fox sparrow so look at those at the base of your feeder here as they should be coming through anytime now um, also a real treat to see if you are so fortunate to do so is our rusty blackbird who again being this far northern breeder is going to be passing through but instead of stopping at your feeder this guy is going to be most likely way at the top in the canopies of trees issuing this call here So whether that sounds to you like a rusty gate swinging open and shut, or to me, it kind of sounds like somebody like rewinding a cassette tape, whatever works for you and helping to distinguish that call from anything else. Um, it's always helpful to kind of assign our own, you know, kind of sounds sometimes to birds calls and songs to help us remember those, right? But this bird contrasted against our red winged blackbird, this bird has some nice kind of rusty brown coloration atop the head and the breast here, but also has this distinctively yellow iris. Um, so those can be helpful field marks when we're looking at the bird if we can see it, but again, really learning that call note or the song rather for the bird can also be helpful as it passes through here. Okie dokie, so now that we've learned a little bit about some of these early arrivals that are going to start settling into territories here and rearing their young, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that we can create for birds that ultimately make for healthy, robust habitat for them. 
In this section, I'm really gonna be focusing on what it means to have good bird food in our habitats, right? But we can also talk about some of the other things here for a second too. So food, of course, can mean a few different things for birds, like insect protein can mean seeds um, or berries or nectar, right? When we're talking about our hummingbird species. But water is also, of course, an essential component of what habitat is for birds, right? They need fresh water, not just to drink, but they also need it to bathe in and to maintain the quality of their feathers, in addition to helping regulate their body temperature during the warm summer months. Shelter, of course, is critical for birds, just like it is for us, right? We don't want to be out in the open when rain is pouring down on us or when it's freezing cold. So birds need shelter too, whether that's, you know, a large tree, a cavity, or just thick vegetation on the ground. They need that in the summertime when it gets hot, if there's a predator nearby, or in the winter for our resident species to be able to tough out those cold winter nights. And of course, our nesting sites are also invaluable to birds, help them rear their young, right? And we know that birds nest in all kinds of places in all kinds of ways. They can nest on the ground, in low-lying shrubs, up in the canopies of trees, or even in tree cavities. But we know that for those that nest outside of cavities, they need materials with which to build their nest too, like we can see with our wood thrush, lots of little sticks and grasses, right? So all of that together really helps us create healthy, robust bird habitat. <clears throat> But again, like I mentioned, we're really gonna be focusing on insects and what insect protein means for our birds. It is the only thing that our songbirds are feeding their young to help them get through these early stages of development, hopefully to then later become adults. And so this caterpillar was brought to us by a Sharon resident last year uh, when she just found it meandering around in her yard. So like most of us, I think she was shocked to find this massive caterpillar, which is in its fifth instar, final stage of development before it goes into metamorphosis. And so brought it to us to just have us have a look at it. If you are a moth fanatic like I am, this moth belongs to the giant silk moth family as a cecropia moth caterpillar, right? So you can look up if you're not familiar with that moth species afterwards, it's a real beauty. And this caterpillar is pretty striking too. Would certainly be a mouthful for most songbirds to be able to pick up and feed their young, but not impossible for some species. So a lot of you I'm sure have been really hearing a lot of buzz about native plants, particularly in this last decade or so, right? And we should be hearing a lot about native plants because uh, people like Doug Tallamy out of the University of Delaware have been doing a lot of scientific research to bring it to our attention, the importance and really the evolutionary relationship of insects and native plants throughout the world, right? Essentially what he tells us is that insects have this very long evolutionary history with native plants that have enabled insects to overcome the chemicals, the defense chemicals that our plants are putting out to ultimately prevent themselves from getting eaten. Right? So insects have overcome this and thus they are able to munch on the leaves of these plants and then go through their stages of development and serve as food for animals, not just for birds, but really for all animals along the food chain. Right, As our insects are at the bases of our food chain, they're helping to feed all sorts of things along the way. So helping us to create really healthy, robust ecosystems. So one book that I love that is of course by <laughs> Dr. Douglas Tallamy is the one I have featured here, Bringing Nature Home. If you are interested in learning about this evolutionary relationship and hearing what he has to say about different you know, types of vegetation and which caterpillar species they host and how this is so important, this is definitely the book for you. One of my favorite parts in this book, believe it or not, is this tidy little chart we see on the right-hand side of my slide here, where we have a variety of different tree families. And then check this out, the number of Lepidopteran, butterfly and moth, species supported on each of these families. If we look at our oaks, 534 species of caterpillar supported. I know I probably couldn't even come up with 30 species of caterpillar if I really had to think about it. So the fact that there are just 534 species of caterpillar out there is amazing. So if we go down this chart, we can see just how many caterpillar species each of these trees families host, right? So really good argument for us to really start considering uh, native trees especially, but also other types of native vegetation in our landscapes. So we're gonna kind of kick it off here with a couple of featured plants that I have with our oaks because we have both white oak and northern red oak in abundance here in Northwestern Connecticut. So remembering that the oak family can host more than 500 different species of caterpillar. These are a great tree to have in our landscapes, but 
being a tree means that this is sort of a long-term payoff kind of arrangement, right? We can't just plant this and then, you know, kind of observe it over the course of the year and say, woohoo, yeah, it's reached its full height and stage of development. All right, let's, let's get 500 caterpillars on this. This is gonna be a long-term investment, right? We're decades before we get to like really kind of the stage of development we see our white oak achieving here. But it doesn't have to be decades until they start to serve as host plants for caterpillars, right? It just takes a while for these guys to grow up. But um, during the course of their lifetime too, they don't just support that huge soiree of caterpillars. They also produce what we know is hard mast or acorns, right? That are really important food source for ground dwelling birds during the winter time, like wild turkey and ruffed grouse and bobwhite. And we know for a whole slew of mammal species during the winter time too. And then in addition, if oaks weren't already excellent, um, we know that there are catkins here displayed in the springtime on my northern red oak also are attractive for pollinating species of insects like beetles and wasps and bee species, which are then attractive to birds, especially those that are coming in from their overwintering grounds and are looking to really bulk up on protein before they start mating and rearing their young for the year, right? So any incoming vireos that we see, any warblers that we see that are coming in, um, you bet they'll want to snack on some of these insects that are attracted to these catkins here on our oak trees. So lots of good reasons to consider planting oaks into our landscape, as well as many of those other trees that I had listed on my chart. One of which, <clears throat> excuse me, was our maples. So our sugar maple here, uh, this photo taken from our property here at Sharon Audubon, um, is very prevalent here in Northwestern Connecticut, I've been finding. We have some impressive maple stands here. Um, so even though these guys as a maple family aren't necessarily listed in the top five in terms of insect biomass that they host, don't forget these guys still host over 235 different caterpillar species, one of which belongs to the beloved rosy maple moth. If you guys have seen these guys as adults in the summertime, uh, this moth will readily come to traps like I had here last summer at the Sharon Audubon Center or you can find them oftentimes just perched on tree bark during the day too. Um, but again, a nice argument to consider putting our sugar maples in our landscape because of how many insects they host. When we contrast this against our Norway maple, for example, which was imported from Europe during the 1700s, this species hosts fewer than five caterpillar species. Why? Well, because it does not have the evolutionary relationship spanning over the course of thousands of years, like our sugar maple has had here in the region for those insects to overcome those defenses and be able to munch on the leaves, right? So are Norway maples attractive? Yes, but do they host a whole lot of bird food? Not necessarily. You could say, hey though, they have a nice full crown. They could make for really suitable habitat for birds, you know, for them to either put a nest in or be able to shelter in during inclement weather. Yes, that is true. But what we find unfortunately with Norway maple is that because that crown is so full and robust, it oftentimes shades out the vegetation that's growing beneath it. And this could be a real problem when this tree sort of escapes, for lack of a better term, and starts to colonize forest tracts because their seedlings in this particular species are abundant and they grow up quickly. So then you might have a sort of monoculture like situation developing in a forest where these trees just start growing up in abundance and shading out a lot of the forest understory, right? So another reason to be able to, again, consider our native maples when putting something into our landscapes. So of course, when we're talking about native plants too, we can consider our native shrubs, like a couple of the species that I have listed here, both the dogwood family, like alternate leaf dogwood or showy dogwood, a flowering dogwood, I mean, and red osier are all great native species that work well in this region for us to be able to incorporate, in addition to other categories of shrubs like our American holly. They not only host an abundance of native caterpillars and other insects, but as you can see in my photo, they are also excellent fruit producers too that really can provide our birds with the supplemental food source of berries. I love both these photos because these birds are just gobbling them up as they're perched on those shrubs, right? And it's great because our hermit thrush here perched on the right or placed on the right-hand side of the slide could be very well using these to fuel up as it completes its migratory journey during the spring or the fall, right? Or probably the fall. So that's when the berries are produced. But our cedar waxwing, however, being a resident species here in Connecticut, could very well benefit from berry production on a variety of different native shrubs during the winter time when food is very scarce. So I'm gonna list a few other native species here of shrubs that we might also consider putting into our landscapes in addition to those that I have in the slide. 
really lots of good stuff here. And even we can think about putting in bearing shrubs that we as humans like to enjoy, right? We have a nice raspberry patch here on the Sharon Audubon property. And oh, even though like staff loves to try to get some of those berries, we love, I think even more is seeing how many birds come and feast on those berries throughout the summer and the fall. So a lot of us do like to incorporate vines into our landscape and that's all very well because it can be very lovely to have in our yards, right? So if we look at the native species here, we have Virginia creeper with its very lovely palmate leaf shape, the five leaflets, not to be confused with poison ivy who has three little leaflets attached to each leaf, right? Virginia creeper hosts over 32 different species of just moth alone. So it can be really prodigious producer of those caterpillars that are gonna be shoved into the mouths of baby birds, right? Some of those including the caterpillar of our Virginia creeper sphinx, which there's the adult fern form you right there. And then our very conspicuous and very interestingly adorned Pandora sphinx are two species of insect that utilize Virginia creeper as a host plant. So not only though, does this um, vine host a variety of different insect species or caterpillars, but it also does produce sometimes a prodigious amount of berries in the fall too, which are very attractive to birds. We know that over 35 different species of birds will consume these berries in the fall, including thrushes and warblers and even woodpeckers sometimes. Little downy woodpeckers might come on and pick those berries off. Contrast this against porcelain berry, for example. And even though these berries are very attractive with their really soft pastel colors and little bird's egg kind of appearance, Ah, they are consumed by birds too, unfortunately, because birds do not discriminate against native and non-native oftentimes with berries. And these babies are spread all over the landscape, which is a problem because if you have this vine in your yard and you've been trying to get rid of it, it's not impossible, but it's difficult. And I speak from firsthand experience helping to manage this particular vine on Sharon Audubon property. One single vine can grow to a length of 25 feet. And they sort of develop this like central nervous system in the soil where all of these other vines shoot out from. And so what they do eventually is they create a sort of mat over native vegetation and they sort of smother it. They prevent it from getting sunlight and then even alter the chemicals in the soil that disrupts plants underneath it from getting the nutrients that they need in the soil too. Um, and these guys, to my knowledge, do not host any species of caterpillar during their development, right? So we will much likely, much more want to prefer having Virginia creeper and other native vines like trumpet creeper in our landscapes as compared to porcelain berry. Last but not least, we cannot forget about the flowers, right? As when we think of native plants, we oftentimes tend to think about uh, incorporating flowers into our landscape because of how lovely they are. And one of my very favorite groups of flower is our cone flowers here, as depicted by our purple cone flower species here, uh, growing at the Sharon Audubon Center. Uh, these species are cone flowers in general. I like that they sort of wear two hats throughout the season, right? So during the spring and the summer, they can host dozens of different caterpillar species, but then they fall, they turn around, and they can feed small songbirds like American goldfinches with their seeds during that season. Uh, if we look at another native species here, Joe pieweed, this is another excellent native flower that we can incorporate into our landscapes, but this one prefers a little bit more moist and wetter habitat. So you can see just the border edge of one of our ponds here. If you have a pond um, in your backyard or you just have some areas of your landscape that just tend to accumulate more moisture and tend to be more wet, then Joe pieweed is a great flower for that kind of landscape. Um, we know that they host over three dozen species of caterpillars, both butterfly and moth. Um, and of course, just like our purple cone flower, they're a great nectar source for our adult pollinator insects as well. Oops, yep, and I forgot to mention too <laughs> that um, our little pearl crescent is one of those caterpillar species and butterflies that really benefit from the cone flower family. So ultimately, whether it's trees we're putting in or it's vines or it's flowers, the more native plants we have in our landscapes, the more caterpillars make it into the mouths of hungry growing birds like our American kestrel nestling we have here, right? So the more baby birds we have too, the more robust our bird populations are going to be, especially in the wake of climate change where we know that at least one third of our birds are going to be impacted by its effects. 
So this is a response that we oftentimes get when we talk to private landowners, in particular through grants that fund this kind of work that we do at Sharon Audubon, right? They say, I want to incorporate native plants and focus on them, but my property is covered in invasives. What do I do? Well, I should note that it isn't necessarily an end game if you do have non-native invasive species on your property, right? Because there are often things that we can do to help manage them. The first of which being learning and being more confident about identifying those non-native invasive species, right? It doesn't do us a whole lot of good if we think what we're pulling out is a non-native invasive and then it turns out to be a native and we just eradicated it from a lot of our landscape, right? So becoming again more confident and being able to make those identifications is a really great first step. So I have two resources that are listed here for folks to check into if they would like to become more familiar with the non-native invasive species here in the region. Don't worry, this will keep you plenty busy because we do have quite a few. So you see those listed there. I will note that through the Connecticut Forest and Park Association, that website is ctwoodlands.org. And I mention it only because I liked the layout of their information so much. They had it um, really in kind of a layout of a card and so for each card, they list a couple of photos on it with some information about the non-native invasive. But then what I loved most is that they gave you native alternatives to consider instead of that non-native invasive. So again, that's ctwoodlands.org for the Connecticut Forest and Park Association little cards. So second, when Eileen and I talked to land managers about managing their invasive species for the benefit of birds, um, we develop a management plan, right? So we might say, hey, you might focus on these plants over here because they're not really that well established and depending on their money, their financial resources, their time and how far they're willing to go and work to eradicate these non-native invasives, we can then sort of gauge which we might tackle first. But sometimes if the property is completely overrun with non-native invasives of all different kinds, we might just say, look, it might be more well, it might be well worth your while to just sort of maintain any open spaces that you have that have not been intruded upon by non-native invasive. So maybe a property owner has a stand of young maple or mountain laurel that hasn't been intruded upon by things like autumn olive or Japanese honeysuckle. And if they have that, birds like this black-throated blue warbler are really gonna like that and are going to be more likely to go and nest and rear their young in a habitat like that. So again, it's not always an end game for folks that they have a lot of non-native invasives, right? It just might be a matter of keeping out those plants from colonizing really kind of clean spaces that are predominantly filled in with native plants. Right, so a few other things we can do to continue to help birds at home in addition to putting in those native plants. I will say that if you are looking for more information on native plants, look no further than plants for birds, right? In addition to looking at those resources I gave you for non-natives, for natives, Audubon has a really impressive initiative housed by its bird-friendly communities department called Plants for Birds. So all you have to do here is jump on Audubon's website, type in Plants for Birds, and it'll take you to a page where then all you have to do is just enter the zip code. Audubon has put a lot of time and energy in developing a super comprehensive database that when you type in that zip code, 06069, for example, you'll get a really comprehensive list of different trees and shrubs, herbaceous plants like flowers to be able to incorporate into your landscapes that are native to this specific region, right? So you don't have to worry about it giving you plants that can be found out in coastal California or in the desert Southwest, that wouldn't make any sense, right? It gives you plants that are native to this region, which is very helpful. And even more helpful, Audubon also gives you nurseries where you can purchase those native plants in any given region as well, because they want you to take that next step in purchasing those native plants and making your habitat more viable for birds. The second thing that we can do is, and of course, move along the spectrum towards um, eliminating our chemicals that we use in our yards. Right, so we know evidence suggests a very strong connection between the plummeting insect populations that Doug Tallamy talks about in bringing nature home um, and chemical usage, right? So it doesn't have to be just on these large industrial scales like we see in a lot of agricultural fields, but this is something that we can think about trying to make an impact on in our own backyards. If we wanna see bluebirds that are breeding and rearing one, two, maybe even three broods in a given summer, right? Bills full of caterpillars, 
we want to do our best to incorporate again moving up on that spectrum to trying to really reduce and maybe even ultimately eliminating chemicals in our yard so that insects are welcome and that birds can then have enough food to rear their young. We know that, for example, black-capped chickadees and rearing just one single brood in the summer over the course of a few weeks can nab up to about 9,000 caterpillars to be able to feed a brood of maybe two to five nestlings, right? 9,000, that's a lot of caterpillars, right? So the more we can do to bolster that, that availability of that food source, the better for birds. Last couple of things, I know that bullet point number three is a contentious issue, so we won't spend too much time on it, but helping to keep our cats indoors, right, is really going to be advantageous for birds because we know that billions of birds a year are slaughtered by our beloved felines when we let them outdoors, whether they're feral or whether they're, they live in our homes and we just let them out for part of the time. So the more time our cats can spend indoors, um, the less chances they have of being able to nab birds and other animals out in the world too. But then of course the safer our cats are indoors too. So something to consider when thinking about bird conservation. Um, last but not least is thinking about how we can help deter birds from crashing into our glass, right? Particularly on our windows. A new company that we have started endorsing here at Audubon is Feather Friendly. So you can check those guys out online. They sell all kinds of different accoutrements from decals that don't obstruct our views out a window to bird friendly tape that we can put to try to deter birds. Um, but this is a really important one, right? Because over a billion birds are estimated to um, be killed every year from glass collisions. So again, just like all the other points, the more we can do to help birds in our backyards, um, hopefully the fewer mortalities we see with our breeding birds this year. So to wrap it all up here at the end, I'll just make a few little comments about our wildlife rehabilitation clinic that we have here at the center. This is one feature of our center that we are very proud of because we are only one of two Audubon centers in the entire country to have a wildlife rehabilitation arm associated with our nature center. And so we do specialize in treating chimney swifts and other aerial insectivores, despite working with a lot of other animals. And what that ultimately means is that we have the capacity to be able to work with those animals. Um, because aerial insectivores eat 12 to 14 hours a day when they're growing up and need to be fed like every 20 minutes, it's a really big endeavor. So if you don't have the staff or the volunteer base to be able to help with that, if you don't have the budget to be able to make sure you can purchase all of those mealworms to feed all of those babies, um, that's gonna be really tough, right? So a lot of independent rehabbers, they just don't have the capacity, but that's something that we have grown again to be able to do thanks to our resources here at the Sharon Audubon Center. So again, that's what it means for us to be able to specialize in working with those bird species. I can't really give you a whole lot of information right now in today's presentation about what to do if you find injured or orphaned birds during the springtime, because like I say in my slide, the protocol is oftentimes very situation specific. It depends on whether or not you see a nest, how high up the nest is, where the baby is. Um, that will be much better handled in a presentation that we are actually hosting with our very own wildlife rehabber, Sunny Kellner, in mid-April. It's going to be all about the role of our wildlife rehabilitation clinic in conservation, and she will give you much more specific information about what you guys can do if you find injured or orphaned birds during the breeding season. I will say, though, that in addition to working heavily with aerial insectivores, we do also work heavily with waterfowl, so with our ducks and geese. You guys are going to see little ducklings here before too long and it's not uncommon that babies get separated from mom as she's moving them from point A to point B. So if you do find a little orphan duckling, you can always give us a call and we will take it because it's important for those guys to be reared with other ducklings during their development. So the more we have, the happier those ducklings are going to be. All righty. Well, thank you everybody for your time today. It was a joy to spend this Saturday evening with you all. At this point, uh, I tried to end a little early to get some question time in, but if folks have questions here for the last few minutes, we can stay on um, for, for a few minutes here and take some of your questions. Uh, Bethany, there's one question there that's what happened to the eagle that was found some time ago? Do you know anything about it? I do, yeah. So I bet the, the person is referring to the Thomaston Eagle, right? That was found at the Thomaston Dam. So that eagle actually has been deemed to be non-releasable due to the injury that it incurred on its wing. So we are currently considering whether or not we can incorporate that eagle into our raptor collection here at the center, but we are not yet sure. Oh. 
Yeah, thank you. Okay. Everyone, don't forget to enter your ideas for topics for future programs in your chat area. That's easy for us to record and follow up on. Hmm. Bethany, this was great. Uh, I, I, you know, we covered a lot, lots of new species that we are not as familiar with, and uh, and also the plants. And I love that plants for birds. Uh, portion of the Audubon site. That's going to be terrific for all of us to use. Great. Yeah. And I apologize, everybody. I forgot to turn my camera off when we started and I realized that the light is coming in kind of oddly <laughs> where my camera is. So I apologize if that was distracting at any point in time. <laughs> Just realize how odd that is. <laughs> all right. Anything else? All right. Yes, uh -huh. Holly. Yes, chestnut sided warbler. If anybody was wondering about the warbler species, yeah, I'm I mean, that is it. One of my personal favorites. There we go. Great, yes. great. All right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, Gail, how do we find info and sign up for the wildlife rehab talk? Yes, great. I did forget to mention that. So if folks are interested, you can jump on our website. That information should be available this coming week. And again, will take place in mid-April, along with the program that we will have on Chimney Swifts, which I'll be hosting at the beginning of April, which will give you behind the scenes footage that nobody ever gets to see of <laughs> Chimney Swifts, which are just a really fascinating species. And again, a species we work heavily here with at the Wildlife Rehab Clinic. So that'll be happening in the beginning of April, our rehab presentation taking place in the middle, and then we will have a fun um, bird focused trivia event that'll be taking place at the end of April. So all of those can be looked at. I think next week our promotion material should be up on the website and you can sign up for those programs there. Great question. Thank you, Gail. All right, and again, thank you so much for the team at Cornwall Library. Everybody should really give it up for them as well. They worked so hard in promoting this program and have done a fantastic job with assisting, again, from everything from promotions to technological assistance and everything in between. So um, yes, I hope you guys show us, uh, the Cornwall Library some love too and any donations that you make at the end of this program as they've been such a really wonderful asset to work with. Thanks, Bethany. I'm looking forward to your programs. I'll certainly attend. Ah, oh, thank you, Sandy. I appreciate it. And I'm sure as many of you know, Sandy is very active in monitoring Eastern bluebirds. So if anybody has any bluebird specific questions, I bet Sandy, you might be a good person to go to, right? Well, I hope something I have to write an, I have to write an article for another Audubon newsletter all about Eastern bluebirds. So I'm going to be getting smarter and smarter. <laughs> oh, very good. Yeah. Very good. Blair. Yes. So the name of that book that we mentioned early in the program is called. Um, oh, my gosh. It's called. Bringing nature home. <laughs> I always want to say it's gardening for wildlife or something like that, but it's bringing nature home by Doug Tallamy. Yes, you're welcome, everybody. Thank you so much again for spending this Saturday with us. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. Spring's next week, a week from today. Yes, very exciting. Hopefully everybody will continue to see more spring migrants continue pouring into this area, in addition to some of those early arrivals we mentioned. Just one more question, Bethany. Um, mm -hmm. I know that we can't have organized walks yet, but people can go to the go on the trails, can they not? And look for the birds they see that are returning. Yes, great, Sandy. Thanks. They can. Um, yes, yes, Larry. I did get your check. Thank you so much. Larry brought some bluebird boxes from us earlier this afternoon. So yes, I did get your check. Thank you. Um, and yes, yeah, Sandy. Back to your question. People are certainly welcome to walk the trails right now, as they are all open for the most part. We have a little minor closure on our bog meadow trail. Um, so that's partially closed off, but most of it's still available. So people can see you know, birds on our property as well as visit our raptors. In the month of April though, we will actually open small group uh, bird walks again. So people can come bird on our property um, with me on first Friday over at Miles Wildlife Sanctuary. And then on every subsequent Saturday during April here at the Sharon Audubon Center. So if folks are interested in that too, um, you can look for those to sign up on, on our website as well, hopefully beginning next week. 
<laughs> hey, everybody. Have a great uh, rest of your weekend. Um, feel free to get in touch with the library by phone or whatever to tell us topics for the future programs and Audubon. Of course, you know how to reach them and find out more things. Yeah, I know you've gotten some inquiries, haven't you, Bethany, already? I think there are a lot of Bluebird box purchasers, I, and, and I think even the feeders were getting some inquiries about that. So, uh. Yes, yes. Um, so Mike Dudek is our, our Bluebird guy here at the Sharon Audubon Center, so he makes them. Uh, so if anybody would like to put in an order with us, you're more than welcome to, and we can give you more info about pricing and things like that. <clears throat> I want to, I, there's one more quick question. Is regular uh -huh. Scott Lawn fertilizer kill insects? Hmm. Not sure about that particular brand of fertilizer. So if anybody else any comments on that, you're more than welcome to submit them. Um, we just generally tend to recommend a sort of slow release fertilizer, right? So it doesn't have as heavy of impact on the soil and on soil inhabitants. So yeah, um, for whomever asked that question, I'd be happy to look more into that and then get back with them with the more specific info. Okay, I've taken down the name. We'll see what we can do. Okay, thank Great. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you.